I had done research in Paris for three previous books, for my John Adams biography, for the Truman biography because of Truman's time in P France during First World War, and for my book about the Panama Canal because of the great involvement of the French in the project. So I had had some experience in doing research there. And, uh, and I, I felt strongly that I did not want to do the Adams Franklin Jefferson period of Americans in Paris because I, I'd already done that in my Adams biography. I didn't want to do the Gertrude Stein Fitzgerald Hemingway period, the so-called lost generation, because I felt it had been, in, been done and done again and overdone and it didn't interest me. I've always liked to go where others haven't gone yet or have gone uh, lightly. Um, and here was a period between 1830 and 1900 about which almost nothing had been written. Now, a good deal had been written about individual characters that are included in my book, but nothing, no one had really stopped to take a look at what was the American experience in Paris in that 70 year uh, span and what effect did it have on us and our story. And that's what interested me. I couldn't include everybody because obviously if you did that it would become a catalog. So I had to pick and choose who, my, who, was, who would to be in my cast, which was a, a liberating sensation because if you're writing history or biography of the more conventional kind, that's, that's obligatory. That you're on a track, you have to include certain people, you have to not skirt by certain events, whether you like it or not or whether that individual person happens to bore you. Uh, you can't leave him or her out simply because she's not your cup of tea. And I, I felt with this, this idea, the form of the book, I could choose. So in a way, they came and auditioned for me. <laughs> and they would come in and tell me their story, and then I'd say, well, show me what you can do. And they would do it, and I'd say, don't call me, I'll call you. <laughs> and, and uh, some of the very finest of them I didn't call because uh, they weren't changed by the experience. Uh, Winslow Homer was a perfect example. He was pretty well, not pretty well, very well formed as a major painter with a definite style when he went to Paris. And so while he, he enjoyed Paris and, did, and, and worked hard while he was there, it didn't change him, didn't change his work. Also, one of the criteria was that they had to be people who wrote about it. Otherwise, there's nothing to work with, either in diaries or letters or memoirs written later, which uh, were substantive and, and not a glossing over and clouded by a poor memory. And, uh, and Homer, uh, Winslow Homer wrote virtually nothing. Uh, Thomas Aikens, very, very important painter, also I don't feel was greatly changed by his time in Paris. He did write some about it, but he, did, he did, was not included. Whereas Henry Tanner, Henry O. Tanner, who grew up as a child in Pittsburgh, spent most of his youth in Philadelphia, uh, one of the earliest uh, African-American artists of real consequence, he did write about it, and quite engagingly and quite uh, um, interestingly. Uh, others like uh, uh, George Healy, a name that probably means nothing much to you, or, but I'll get to him shortly. Um, uh, Samuel F. B. Morse, the famous inventor of the telegraph. Uh, James Fenimore Cooper. Uh, Elizabeth Blackwell, a character about whom I knew very little when I started. One of the joys of the work is the discoveries that come along, including individual uh, people of real consequence. She was the first American woman to become a physician. And the kind of courage and determination that took to, to achieve is admirable in the extreme. Uh, she studied in Paris. Then there are people like Henry James, Henry Adams, major writers and uh, architects. Uh, Richard H. Morris Hunt, uh, who brought back the Beaux-Arts style uh, in, uh, in, 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 in spades and is probably best known for the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York or good old H. H. Richardson, one of whose greatest of all works, the county jail and 
courthouse uh, is a Pittsburgh landmark. Uh, Louis Sullivan, uh, Charles McKim of McKim, Mead and White, uh, Stanford White of McKim, Mead and White, major American architects who all spent time in Paris. They, uh, Richard Morris Hunt was the first American student admitted to the Hold of Beaux Arts as a student. Uh, and it was a huge accomplishment. And he wasn't, he didn't pass the test at first, and he said, as soon as he found out, I'll have to do it again. They wouldn't give up. I think that's extremely important. Also, these people were not disenchanted with America. They did not feel alienated by their country, as, they, as those of the lost generation crew, crowd did. Nor is there any self-pity. Woe is me, I'm so alone here in Paris, but having a good time. Uh, and by the way, I don't think the lost generation was lost. I think they knew exactly where they were. They were in Paris. Um, these people um, were determined not only to perfect their ability, ambition to excel. And they wrote about it. Not ambition for power, not ambition for money or celebrity, to excel, to make the most of what I am, as one of them said and to come back and use that new power, that new understanding, that new idea for the betterment, the improvement, the uplifting of the level of culture in their own country. Now, a man like Morse is a perfect example, an exceptional example of bringing something home. They all brought something home, figuratively or literally, at least all those that I have written about. Morse went over to paint. He was already a very accomplished painter but he wanted to be better, and he said, I need Paris in that respect. He then attempted something nobody had ever tried, which is to paint a, a very large uh, six by nine foot interior of the Louvre, showing those masterpieces that he felt Americans should know about and appreciate. Keep in mind, there are no color reproductions of paintings. There are no museums where you can go and look at paintings, uh, and there's no way to ever see any of these except in a black and white engraving, which is often not very good. So the, in the same spirit that Jefferson came home with 88 crates of books and paintings and all kinds of things, because he'd hoped it would help lift up American appreciation of, of the arts, Morris was gonna bring back that painting. And he did, he did it. And he painted it under the most adverse conditions imaginable which is almost never mentioned in what is written by art historians about the painting, and that is it was done in the middle of the most horrible uh, cholera epidemic ever to hit Europe, the first cholera epidemic to hit in the worst, during which in Paris alone, in less than six months, 18,000 people died. They were dying, dropping dead in the streets, and Morse was writing letters back to his brothers saying, I don't know, they're all, uh, die in my sleep tonight. But he refused to leave. Most everybody who could get out of Paris got out as fast as possible. But he refused to leave because he was determined to finish the work before the, the Louvre closed in the fall. And his money was running out. James Fenimore Cooper, a friend from New York, but became a fast friend in Paris because as often happens, we've met, many of us have had the same experience. When you're abroad, uh, you make friends with some of your fellow Americans in a way that you might never do, that might never happen back here. And Cooper and Morse became fast friends in Paris. And when the cholera epidemic struck, Cooper couldn't leave because his wife was too ill to move. Every day, Cooper came over to the Louvre, climbed to the second floor, to the Cal Serre, Cal Carre, the, uh, the room that he was depicting in his painting, to sit with Morse, while he worked to keep his courage up and to entertain him or to amuse, uh, crack jokes or whatever, because he knew th that this fellow was near the breaking point. Now as a story of a friend in need, a, a friendship seeing two remarkable people through a very um, dangerous and uh, unpleasant time, I seldom know, I've known a very few situations comparable. I could have written a whole book just on that painting and how it happened to be. I could have written a whole book on the uh, medical students and what they went through because of what they wrote, their diaries, their letters, 
And, uh, and to discover those, to find those, is a thrilling part of the work. People say, well, do you like what you do? I love what I do. And part of it is that very sense of the detective case and the discovery that comes with it. And with this particular book, I had the good fortune, working with my research assistant, Mike Hill, to discover one of the most thrilling um, unknown treasures uh, of a historic kind in my working life, the diary of a man named Elihu Washburn. Elihu Wash Washburn was one of four brothers who served in the United States Congress at the same time from four different states. It never happened before, it's never happened since. They were in Congress shortly before the Civil War and they were great abolitionists. Elihu Washburn came from Illinois, from Galena, Illinois. And while in Illinois and in politics, he became a very close friend of Abraham Lincoln. And when Lincoln was elected, Elihu Washburn became his strongest supporter and strongest uh, spokesman in the House of Representatives. Washburn virtually worked himself to death during the Civil War and afterward was spent in physically, emotionally, and became quite ill. And Grant, who had been a friend of his in Galena, Illinois, where he lived, and, and whose ability more, uh, Washburn kept telling Lincoln about, urging him to give this man more command, give him more bigger part in the, in the struggle, and finally convinced Lincoln to make, put him in full command after the war was over, after Lincoln was dead, and Grant had become a, the president, Grant appointed Washburn our minister to Paris, where Washburn expected he could recover his strength, recover his outlook on life by just being in Paris. His wife was fluent in French, and uh, it was a very happy choice for the whole family. But they arrived on the eve of the Franco-Prussian War. And without, um, Without telling you the whole story of the Franco-Prussian War, let me just remind you quickly of what happened. Franco-Prussian War was part one of a three-part world catastrophe that was Franco-Prussian War, World War I, World War II. The Germans advanced, the, the war started over nothing. Inexcusable it was ever, ever became an issue. It was concerned a diplomatic uh, decision that had to be made about the royal family in Spain. Absurd. The Germans advanced on France about as fast as an army ever has moved. And it was very clear that they, they were going to put Paris under siege. Every other diplomat of a, of a major power left immediately, except Washburn, who determined to stay as he said, because he felt it was his, his duty as long as there were Americans in Paris. Before the war began, there were somewhere between six and 7,000 Americans in Paris. By the time the Germans had the city surrounded and nobody could get out, there were about 150 Americans there, including Washburn. After the, Frank, after the siege, when Paris finally surrendered because the Germans had starved the city to death, they were living on, literally on rats or anything else. All the animals in the zoo, horses, anything that moved, they would kill and eat. Horrible, horrible time. And then there was a brief interlude after the surrender, and then the commune erupted, as it's known, which was a civil war of French killing themselves, French killing French, which was one of the most bloody, ugly, unpleasant convulsions of the worst side of, Amer of, human, of the human nature in history, in which thousands of people, after 65,000 had been killed in Paris alone during the war, thousands of people were shot dead in the streets, executed, and not soldiers or would-be spies, but men, women, children, Hundreds and hundreds of priests taken and put against the wall and killed. Washburn stayed through all of that because, again, he felt duty bound.
But through all of this, he kept a diary every single day. And nobody had known about the diary because it had been filed in a peculiar fashion at the Library of Congress, which I won't try to explain. It's too complicated. <laughs> but what was filed was a letterpress copy of the diary. And the diary was written on separate sheets of paper, and they were bound in with other things, other letters. And unless you were really looking, oh, there's a diary in here, you'd never know. So if the letterpress copy was in the Library of Congress, then the question obviously was, where's the real thing? And the real thing was up in little Livermore, Maine, on the, on the uh, border of uh, Maine and, and New Hampshire, westernmost Maine, uh, in the fam in the, where the family came from. And, uh, and as I say, it, it, it is phenomenal. And to, it, it, if in TypeScript, it runs to about 60, 60 pages, uh, double-spaced uh, pages. And all of it, again, is superbly written. It's not just, I saw this, I met with so-and-so, I got home late at 1 o'clock after seeing. No, it's very descriptive and right from the heart. Unlike his official correspondence, it tells you what he really felt. It tells you how horrified, how, how uh, rep repulsive it all is, and how exhausted he is, and how depressed he's getting. It's marvelous material. And um, I'm as happy about that part of this book as almost anything I've ever been able to bring uh, to the public eye. Then after that war was over, as so often happens, it was a, the surge of creative rebuilding. 60,000 stonemasons went to work to rebuild Paris almost overnight. Phenomenal. So this destructive impulse is followed by a very powerful constructive impulse. Now through all this, the, the Americans are coming and going, and many of them stay on. Um, Mary Putnam, another uh, candidate for a doctor's a degree in medicine, she too wanted to become a doctor, refused to leave because she was determined to finish her, her uh, thesis and get her degree. And there were plenty of others who stayed through the horrors of both the, of the uh, uh, siege and the commune. And afterward, people like St. Gaudens came back. He had been a student before the war. And then people like Mary Cassatt, who was born here in Pittsburgh, old Allegheny City, and whose father was the first mayor ever of Allegheny City. Her mother, too, came from Pittsburgh. She and they then later moved to Philadelphia. She was the first <coughs> woman to be accepted by the French Impressionists as one of them. And she was a very important one of them, the only American to be accepted as one of them. And she had determined that she was not going to be known as a woman who paints. Uh, w women of fashion, women of society, it was all right if they did little watercolors of flower arrangements and so forth. That, that was acceptable. But she wanted to be a painter, period. And she was willing to sacrifice almost anything to do so. And she had to support and look after her parents who moved to Paris to be with her the whole time she was really coming into her own when she started painting the scenes of mothers and child. John Singer Sargent, in my view, uh, the greatest of American artists of the 19th century. Uh, John Singer Sargent uh, painted at least three of his major masterpieces in Paris when he was still in his 20s. He was breathtaking. Uh, the, the, great, the great painters of the day, French painters of the day uh, in Paris, looked at his work with awe. They'd never seen anything like it. And uh, his story, too, is, is utterly fascinating because it was such a different kind of life. He had, didn't have to cross the Atlantic to get there to become a student in art. He would never lived anywhere other than Europe because his, his mother and father were self-inflicted uh, self, uh, uh, exiles in, for a very interesting reason. They were people of some means and in social importance before they left Philadelphia, but their, their income, their wherewithal, began to decline rather noticeably. 
And rather than face the embarrassment that that would bring to them in Philadelphia, they went to Europe where one could live very well on about a third or less than a third of what it cost to live here. So they were hiding out from their failure as, uh, as uh, social and, and financial successes. And the father was dying to go home. He just was terribly homesick and sad. But the mother insisted that they had to stay in France. And since what income they had came from her, uh, she ruled the roost. So they stayed. But the father's pride in this boy, the father's exhilaration that a child of theirs could so rise in the eyes of those who had a capacity to judge art and music and the rest on both sides of the Atlantic really was a, a saving uh, a grace for him in, a, in an old age that was otherwise miserable. 